Uh, good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. Thanks a lot for joining yet another session of uh, Lunch and Learn with Mukesh. Uh, this is also a recording that I'm doing for my podcast, Pushing Beyond the Obvious. Um, uh, and this is the fifth season of the podcast and uh, focused on uh, leadership and leading uh, transformation as such. Uh, for people who have been following me on this journey, uh, you know that I try to bring in experts uh, and thought leaders from different domains uh, and see and kind of you know pick their brains to understand how their expertise can actually help us be better leaders and uh, drive better results for our um, businesses. So in that uh, uh, same uh, uh, vein, I'm today really, really happy to uh, uh, have with us uh, Efrat Coldred. Uh, all of you who have followed me on LinkedIn or who have known me for any period of time uh, know uh, how much impact uh, Dr. Eli Goldratt has had on my thinking. Um, I recently read the book that uh, Efrat wrote, um, and I must say that uh, uh, it's as impactful as any of the other books that I have read. So before we go any, any further, I want uh, to request Efrat, if you can just quickly introduce yourself and the body of work that you've done, and then we can kind of uh, take it forward from there on. That would be my pleasure. <laughs> Well, my name is, as you said, my name is Efrat Goldratt, and I am the daughter of Dr. Eli Goldratt, the founder of the Theory of Constraints. Uh, my father dedicated his life to find systematic ways to make people do better and reach their potential and reach success, whether in their individual lives or in their uh, business um, businesses and organizations. Uh, it is almost 40 years ago since he published the book, The Goal, that was read by tens of thousands of people, I should say 10 millions of people uh, around the world. And after he um, developed the field of a uh, production, he turned, uh, which, which the introduction is the goal, he wrote a few more books about production, and then he turned his attention to project management. And he, after his initial book, The Critical Chain was published, he dedicated two decades to go into the heart of project management and fully realize what should be the proper way to make the multi-project environment more simple, more manageable, and help people really achieve their goals in that uh, complicated area. And I was, very enthused about his material because as a psychologist, I can clearly see how everything that he was talking about for organizations also applies precisely the same way and on the same level of value to individuals. He was getting ready to write the next book about it and he passed away. And for 10 years, I was looking for the right person to, re to write a new book. And everyone told me, that's not going to be me. That's not going to be me. And after 10 years, I said, fine, I understand the message. I will be the one sitting down. I am well familiar with his writing style. I, I, uh, I was fortunate to be in his inner writing circle for all of his books after the first book. And I have the right name. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, the book was published, so it is my absolute honor to join you on your podcast and have the opportunity to talk about this, uh, this material that he has developed uh, for better management of multi-project environments. I think the book could not have come at a better time uh, because uh, right now we are living in a world where almost everyone uh, is working in a multi-project environment, whether it is uh, in their businesses, whether it is in their personal lives. And I think uh, what um, uh, you've written or covered in your book applies as much uh, to businesses as much as to individuals. So congratulations on having done that. So coming back, right? So one of, <laughs> one of the uh, things that everyone talks about uh, uh, when it comes to projects and large scale transformation, which is typically multi-project multi environment, is a McKinsey study, which is probably about 10, 12, 15 years old, uh, which states that you know, about 70% of projects uh, fail to achieve uh, what they set out to uh, uh, achieve or their original intentions, right? So, um, so in your experience, first question, is this true? If yes, what do you think are the 
fundamental root causes for this? Well, first of all, uh, nowadays with the pressure that people are under, I think that uh, I hear from many people that the McKinsey results were actually optimistic and it's over 80% of the um, uh, projects nowadays that suffer. And first and foremost, they suffer from delays. Things take longer, people are late, people have a very, very hard time finishing on time, delivering on time. And many times as a result, they have to utilize resources that belong to other projects. And thus they go over budget and they cause the other projects to be late. And very often now we just in order to finish it with whatever we can and move on, we also compromise on the content. So yes, that, that uh, McKinsey result is very uh, valid. And the way to better managing it is understanding what is causing it. And when I ask people, and we did a lot of polls for decades now, what, what's behind the delays? What is causing the constant delays? Um, at least, the, of course, there are, there are many different uh, answers to that, but I'm asking the number one cause that is by far more uh, prominent and major to that delay, people saying it's the uncertainty. You know, things pop, things happen, unexpected delays, and we didn't see it coming. There is not much that we can do about it. Um, uncertainty is, by definition, uncertainty, so we cannot really control it and there is nothing we can do. And all that we is left to do is just live with it and, and get as much done and that's it. Well, the reality of the situation is that this is not the case, which is an excellent um, idea because if this is not the case, there are actually a lot of things that we can do. Let me give you a hypothetical scenario. Let's say that you are the manager and you tell your people, listen, if you need more time, if you get delayed and you need more time, just come to me and I will give you the time that you need if you tell me the truth about why it was that you didn't finish on time. No excuses, no mishmash, just tell me the truth. What, why didn't you work on that project to finish on time? I will give you the time. People are not delayed by uncertainty. Most of the cases when people approach the managers in order to ask for, for more time, if they tell you the truth, it will be that they were busy working on something else. That is the number one reason. Under the pressure to make progress in so many projects, we are multitasking. We jump from one project to another. And that is the cause, that is the major cause for most of more the delays. People are very surprised by that answer. Uh, they don't really see that this is the effect of multitasking. Actually, people tend to believe that multitasking is either, you know, force of nature, we have to do it, or that actually multitasking is a good thing. And we are actually looking for people with good multitasking skills for management uh, positions uh, to that extent. So let me, let me demonstrate to you what is the real effect of multitasking, okay? Let me share my screen here for a minute. Can everyone see that? Yes. Excellent, excellent. So let's say that we are multitasking between three projects that each of them is taking nine days. I'm, I'm making it as simple as possible for the purposes of this example. So we start working on the first day, we start working on project A and we focus on it and we get things done and we finish it as promised in nine days. And on the 10th day, we start working on project B we work on it, we invest the time, and we finish it after nine days. So this is day 18. And then on the next day, we start working on project C, we finish it in nine days. Now I can already see the people in the audience here with us raising their eyebrows saying, if what, come on, this is not realistic. There is no way we can do that. The pressure is so hard that we have to multitask. We so let's see what is the effect of multitasking. 
So we start working on project A and we get it, let's say for the sake of this exercise, a third of it done. And then the pressure to, to, to move and show a, a project B that we are working on that one is, is so immense that we switch to project B. And after we get third of it done, we go to work on project C and we get third of it done. And we are here after day nine. How many projects did we complete? Mukesh, help me out. Zero. 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 So, okay, we are under pressure. We have to get working. We go back to project A and we work on it as fast as possible and we accomplish another third of it before the pressure to move uh, to another uh, project is too hard to bear. And we move to project B and we get a third of it done. And then we move to project C and we get another third of it done. And we are here after 18 days. How many projects did we finish? Still zero. Zero. We finish project A after 21 days. Not nine, 21. This is the real effect of multitasking. It makes everything a lot longer than it should be. And because of it, other people are waiting for us. And now let me ask you, I don't know about you, but I know about me. How many of us are multitasking between only nine projects? How many of us are working in such ideal scenarios where unexpected things don't happen? And how many of us can really jump into the next project and there is no setup time? We don't have to remember what we did and it doesn't take us time to dive back. And when we go back, the people that we need are available to us. Because of the multitasking, everything takes forever. This is the real price that we are making. So if we want to manage projects better, what we need to do is we need to take a hard look at our operation and figure out, and there are multiple ways to go about it. And, and if people need help about it for, a, you know, uh, um, there are quite a few consultancy companies who can help with that, but most companies can figure it out on their own. We have to make sure that we reduce the multitasking, that we jo don't jump from one uh, uh, project to another, and that we work on a, on a number of projects that make sense to, uh, to our operation. Not too much, not too many. And even after we reduce the multitasking, it makes a lot of sense to prioritize. So we work on project A for as long as we can before we need someone else's uh, thing, and then only we move. Minimize the multitasking to get things done. You will see that the flow gets going, that we will accomplish just by doing that, we will accomplish a lot more. Interesting. And so it, that was, that this was is also similar. Answer to uh, uh, one question. <laughs> Sorry about that. Well, <laughs> So the, the point that um, uh, uh, comes to me when I hear this or the counter argument that when I hear people, when I talk about this to people is that uh, the answer is not, uh, not to multitask, but the answer is to be more productive when uh, in whatever it is that you're trying to do. So uh, there is a whole slew of uh, experts, there's a whole slew of literature, there's a whole slew of courses that today focus on improving your productivity uh, on whatever it is that you're doing rather than look at uh, what is the fundamental reason because of which um, uh, you know the projects are getting delayed it's like addressing the symptom and not really addressing the root cause whereas if i understand correctly what we do if we focus on um, uh, p projects and in the book you talk about triage which is the medical system uh, at in an emergency room, uh, when patients come in, the emergency doctors actually do a triage right at the start as to you know who needs the attention first, and then uh, uh, kind of you know uh, after that they pick the next best or the next urgent person or the next more critical patient and kind of move on. So you talk about this in your book as well uh, when it comes to projects as uh, pick and choose those uh, projects which has the maximum amount of impact and keep as less projects as ongoing at any given point in time uh, so that uh, the even if someone is um, uh, 
by habit by habit wants to multitask the opportunity to multitask is also not very high that's something that i really um, liked and uh, it also helps in another uh, way maybe you know you should you can talk about this a little bit as well which is uh, by focusing on uh, these uh, um, uh, productivity needs uh, uh, you know uh, what we end up doing is looking at uh, local uh, impact uh, vis a vis uh, you know instead of focusing on leverage which is what uh, uh, not multitasking or good multitasking does uh, to create global optimum so there is this entire conversation around local optima versus global optima uh, which um, uh, uh, is very very fundamental when it comes to the concepts of toc can you just expand on on this a little bit um, uh, as well a pleasure here is the situation this is our starting point this is our pipe right and it's full of projects it's whenever we can we, we try to cram more because we, we try to get as much done as possible and in order to show the client that we are um here to help them whenever we sign a new contract we start working it right away and this is probably this is how our pipe this is how our production or our operation looks like everyone are under pressure to get the flow going so many people's assumption is that no matter where we find an opportunity to improve let's just push it because wherever we push it will get things forward and this is the local optima people also assume that um, if we uh, make an improvement here an improvement there an improvement at the bottom an improvement at the top at the beginning at the end they will accumulate and in the end the, the, the uh, flow will go faster the reality of the situation is that the, these local optimum don't ever don't mount to anything and they don't help a lot the only place that you should focus on improvement to make a real improvement is the constraint after we reduce the multitasking, we have a visibility that we never had before. We can actually see what part of our operation has less capacity, where things are stuck in a queue that we have to resolve. So if we truly want to improve our operation, if we want to get the flow going, there is one place that we need to focus our effort if we want the global optimum to be better, and that's the constraint. Now I'm saying again, as long as the pipe looks like that, what are our chances of, of uh, identifying the constraint? Where is it? We have no idea. Everything is stuck, no everything is waiting in line. It's only after we reduce the multitasking that if we that if we take a look and we see where things are stuck, we can very easily see where the constraint is. And now utilizing the five focusing steps, and I'm sure those of you who are familiar with the goal and QC know exactly what I'm talking about. It's not complicated. We want to get more out of the flow. Let's focus on the constraint. Let's get as much as possible from the constraint. That will help us get a lot more of the flow and get the flow faster. If we are in such a situation where we have a constraint in our uh, operation and we keep the multitasking, what are the, what are the benefits? Nothing. We just keep pushing and the queue gets longer. But if more projects wait in queue, it doesn't mean they will be pushed further. It just means they will be waiting in line for longer. So this is why so, uh, better management means focus. So identifying where the constraint is and kind of you know making sure that uh, you work around the constraint rather than uh, try to improve everything uh, everywhere at the same time, right? Absolutely. Because listen, if we are making local improvements, we also want our men. We also want. We believe in these improvements. We want to keep these improvements. We spread the management attention, keeping so many improvements alive, alive, and making sure they don't go by the wayside. Which means we spread the management attention to thing on things that are not going to matter. If they are not the constraint, they are not going to make the flow faster. We know that. 
So to focus management attention, the right thing to do is to look at the global picture, identify the constraint and move forward from there. Focus on the constraint. Who, whose job is it to identify this constraint uh, in a way, if I may ask, because ultimately what happens uh, in most large organizations which are operating in these uh, multi-project uh, environments, right? Uh, so the project managers are measured on uh, how many projects are they able to deliver on time, on budget, on spec, um, uh, which means that, you know, the sales teams will continue to sell projects, uh, uh, which will keep coming into uh, your project pipeline. And uh, uh, which means that, you know, every time there's a project that comes into the pipeline, some project manager needs to start, or at least the assumption is that they need to start uh, working on it. So where does this focus or where does this responsibility of finding the constraint fall? Well, this is an excellent question because people in the trenches, especially with multitasking, they will have no idea. All they can do is keep their head down and, and work as fast as possible and as hard as possible, and they have no idea. The visibility lies with the management and it only happens after they reduce the multitasking. Mm. So it is the authority and the responsibility of the managers who are in charge of the operation to get the flow going. Nevertheless, without the full collaboration of the people below them, it's not going to happen. We know that. Yeah, I think it, it it's a complete uh, change of how uh, you operate uh, uh, top to bottom, uh, if I may say so. So you mentioned uh, flow. Uh, uh, and why uh, looking at uh, our work uh, in a multi-project environment from, a, from the lens of flow is important. Your book is also focusing on flow, right? So it's called Goldratt's Rules of Flow. So why is it that flow is so important uh, for not only multi-project environments, but also I think uh, in the entire concept of uh, theory of constraints, uh, whether it is manufacturing, whether it is projects. Um, uh, Dr. Goldratt always spoke about flow. You're talking about flow as well. So why is flow so critical? Is this the same thing as throughput? And what are the most fundamental rules of flow? What is the most fundamental rule of flow? This is a question that I'm hearing many times because people want the short answer. And people have different ideas. Is the most important uh, uh, full kit? Is the most important uh, rule of flow uh, triage? But the fact of the matter is the most important rule of flow is the one that is currently blocking your flow. There are many obstacles to flow. This is, this is another thing that we see when we, when we reduce the multitasking. The obstacles to flow start to be very visible. By far, the first one to the flow, the largest one is the multitasking itself. As soon as we take care of it, we can already see what are the other things that are blocking our flow. So the most important one is the one that is blocking your flow. We can tell from experience with hundreds of companies around the world that some rules of flow are very common and we see them again and again. Uh, other rules of flow are very specific. Let me give you a few examples. Do we still have time? Yeah, please go ahead. Awesome. One of the most common rules of flow that we see again and again is lack of full kit, which means I need to work on a certain project now and I'm keen to, to continue uh, and I get started and something is missing and I have to stop. There is a delay. Either uh, someone was supposed to prepare something for me and they didn't get around to it. I needed authorization or someone's signature and it's missing. Uh, the client told me what he wants, but there is one requirement that is missing. Now I have to ask him. There is no full kit and without any full kit, we start, there is a delay because now we have to start gathering all these things in order to move forward. And now we are stuck. We have to wait for all these things. So we start working on another project, but we get stuck there. So we start working on a third project. And pretty soon we are back into the uh, uh, environment of multitasking and the chaos starts again. 
full kit is a profound concept. It is so simple, yet so profound. Before we start working on our projects at the entry point, right at the beginning of our flow, we need to have a gate. When the project is at the entry point to our operation, we should never start working on it before we make sure that we have a full kit, that we are able to actually get started and, and work on it until either we need to uh, we finish it or we can hand it over to the next line, the next team, the next person who needs to work on it. If we don't ensure full kit, we will be delayed for sure. So one of the things in proper management of multitask in multitasking environment is to make sure that we have such a gate, a closed gate at the beginning, that there are experts uh, preparing the list of full kits that we know what we need to, uh, uh, to uh, accomplish. And there is a gatekeeper that is actually checking. Do you have everything you need? Green light, you can start working on that project. I can tell you for a fact that if it's done that way, nowadays, our experts in every operation are busy from sun uh, arise to sundown fighting fires with things that are happening and they're constantly multitasking between fires. But when we reduce the multitasking into the number of projects that our operation is capable of handling and we take care of full kits, the experts have such fewer fires that they can actually dedicate their times to do a full kit, to prepare the list for a full kit. And it's by far a better use of their time. This is proper management of multi-project of, of multi environment. So this is an example for, for another obstacle to flow that is very common, lack of full kit. But in other organizations that we go to, other, um, other obstacles might be prominent. For example, one, one uh, uh, organization that I recently uh, came across, and this is very unique. This is why I wanted to say, because you never know when the next obstacle is there. Their organizational culture is such, and it's a profound issue in their culture, is that they don't do little things. If there is something they need to fix, they might as well fix all the things from that area. That obstacles to flow is called decoupling. I will give you an example. One of their key managers couldn't work because her link, her, her um, um, socket uh, uh, in, in the wall linking her to, to a internet wasn't working. And she said, listen, this is an emergency. I can't work. I cannot communicate with my people. I cannot work with, I communicate. Fix the internet to my, in my socket, S-A-S-A-P. But they don't just invite technicians for one thing. So they started to see, okay, where else am I going to need that technician? And they started issuing a survey. Is there anything else that you need to make in that area? And all of a sudden, it becomes such a huge thing that they're not going to just ask the technician that is available because he might be too expensive. So maybe ask, get a few uh, price quotes and, and, and do you see where I'm going with this? Holy Moses, all he needed, that manager was to have his uh, internet fixed right now. That had to be fixed right now. In organizational culture where everything becomes such a project, decoupling, accumulating everything. So, so, so we take care of everything with that is the wrong thing to do. Of course, in, in specific occasions, decoupling is the right thing to do. But as a rule, as, as, a, as part of the culture or as part of a, 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 a way to go by a specific uh, manager, that can become a real issue and a real obstacle to flow, so we have to fix it. And this is why when you asked me what is the most uh, important rule of flow, my answer was the one that is blocking your flow right now. <laughs> I, we never know when we enter a, 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 a company, but if we want to get the flow going, we need to identify the major obstacles to flow and we need to handle them. And then we will see the flow going. Interesting. So, um, what 
you are sharing um, uh, is an approach to management and to work which is so drastically different uh, to how organizations currently work right so what does that mean from a culture point of view how does one go about making this shift from where they are uh, which is you know everyone i i've seen organizations where there are new projects created all the time whether it is projects being sold to customer which means you know there is an actual delivery to a customer uh, to internal projects for improvement of certain areas to uh, uh, projects for employee engagement for projects for uh, you know um, x y z they only keep adding projects more and more and more in the environment rather than reducing um, or closing down any project at all i even know organizations where uh, everyone knows that a particular product or a particular project is doomed it will never complete on time on spec on budget but still because of some cost fallacy they continue to uh, invest on it they continue to work on it while at the same time not allowing the resources to kind of you know work on other projects as well so that's the environment that we are in today uh, the environment that you are talking about is so different how does one go from here to there well i'm 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 very happy that you brought it up because this is precisely the situation and we see it worldwide people are aware of the chaos and are aware of the pressure and because of it they add more pressure and what they did to do is to go the other way around and release the flow to get things happening a lot faster um i can tell you that many years ago when my father started to talk about managing constraints in production uh, in the early 80s he had a similar situation where in production people were cramping more and more things into production a uh, one one a uh, producing uh, one product they were stealing raw material from another thing and then the chaos was was a uh, very very large and he needed some sort of a vehicle to get everyone on board of what it is that change that he was talking about uh, people have a very hard time envisioning how things will look like under the the proper management of multitasking environment and at that point he decided to write the, the goal and i can tell you that at the beginning people were very um skeptic about how a book can make a difference in fact after he wrote the goal he approached all of the top publishers in the usa and he got rejections from every one of them for years he used to keep a letter from one of the largest publishers in 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 the states and the the letter said the following mr goldrat Dr. Goldratt, we appreciate your effort trying to read the, uh, write this book. And if you want to write a management book, we can see you have a, a lot of things to say. We will publish it for sure. If you want to write a novel, try a novel. But a novel that is a management book, we don't even know what shelf to put it on. So apologies, but we reject your book. The book was published by North River Press. and it was read by tens of millions of people and it made a lot of difference because it brought in an organization when people wanted to make a real difference and wanted to replace the chaos with proper management sustainable management that can get a lot more projects done fast on time on budget people need a way to envision what it is that they are going for and have a common um language about priorities what should we implement first the goal made a lot of difference there are so many companies around the world who were able to implement the proper production way of toc way of production just by reading the book and discussing it and because of it i felt that it was my duty to provide something similar so people will have the right uh, vision and this is the book So, so uh, I must say, um, go ahead. No, I must say uh, I have read the book uh, uh, multiple times already. Uh, I got a Kindle version some time back. Uh, by the way, the book is now available uh, worldwide, so you can buy it on Amazon. I've checked it already; it is available there. Um, I um, so when I read Goal, uh, I should tell you this: I I would have read Goal at least forty times uh, in the last fifteen uh, years or so. 
Uh, every time I am stuck somewhere uh, uh, with some problem that I am not able to solve, I go back and read that. Um, and there is some insight in that book, uh, which I had missed last time when I read and which comes up. Um, so it's a layered book, uh, which uh, never uh, surprises, um, never surprises uh, or never uh, disappoints. I believe uh, what you've done with the rules of flow um, is very similar. You've also written a business novel, uh, taking a, a perspective of um, uh, someone who's working in a, a multi-project environment, trying to figure out how to stay afloat. Um, uh, so uh, brilliantly written, very short, succinct, to the point, uh, interesting. So uh, uh, my recommendation is that you know anyone who's uh, working on leading projects, I mean, of course, anyone can and should read the book because that opens your eyes in ways that you cannot imagine. Uh, counterintuitive facts. So for example, one of the things that uh, I take away from the book is that in order to go fast, or in order to complete your projects faster, you need to go slower at the start. So you need to finish faster at the end. Uh, velocity uh, of flow matters more than the mass of projects that you work on. Um, triage, um, picking the right projects to start and to work on when, uh, to start working on them matters a lot uh, as well. Uh, of course, there is a whole lot of change management that needs to be done. Uh, your key leaders need to be bought in. Uh, uh, need to understand uh, uh, how this works. So one of the things that I have done in the past is, um, uh, this is this was my first job, by the way, and uh, I was trying to do something. And my boss was not really happy uh, uh, with my approach, and I gave him uh, uh, the goal for him to read. Uh, he read it, and then he said, okay, now I understand what you're trying to do. Go ahead and do what uh, you wanted to do. So uh, if, if you are listening to this... <laughs> Yeah. So uh, if, if you want to work in an environment where uh, you get the satisfaction of starting and completing projects of having impact rather than just being busy, uh, not only read this book, but also buy one for your boss and one for your boss's boss um, uh, and gift it to them. Uh, I can tell you uh, they will be really, really happy that you did that. And it also, you know, in a way uh, helps you in the long term. Uh, because uh, it also kind of you know, positions you as a as someone who cares about the business uh, and that also accelerates your um, uh, career from that point of view. So, so you can buy the book, uh, Goldratt's Rules of Flow, everywhere books are sold. A few more uh, things that I want to mention with your permission. One is you mentioned if you want to accomplish more, don't go faster, go slower. What my father used to say is if you want to accomplish more, don't go faster, focus. The, what we need to do is, is instead of jumping all over the place, multitasking, we need to focus. It's not about slower or faster. We will still be amazingly busy because we want to get things done. We go and want to get as many projects. We want to get as many customers. But the focusing is the point. Um, I, you have here... Um, the image of, of, of the book, one of the things that I, use, that I did a lot of research on is how to make it as short as possible. It's 170 pages. I, I know that people are busy today. I know that people can't afford to take two days out of their time to read a hefty 500 pages book. And believe me, it would have been a lot more easier to write mm -hmm. 400 pages, a lot easier. Um, there is one more other thing uh, to do, and this is why I think that the, the uh, date of your podcast is perfect. <laughs> if you open the book and you see the copyrights inside, you will see that Rutledge, uh, Taylor and Francis, my uh, British publisher, the copyrights are 2024. When the book was published, I did not imagine the demand for it. And actually what they did was they, they moved it ahead of line and published it a year ahead of time. And finally, as of September 1st, which was what, a few days ago, it is available on all Amazon stores worldwide. It is a med available as an audiobook, as an ebook, as a printed book, and it's short. One of the things that I did not mention earlier are the psychological prices that we are paying under, living under that pressure in a multitasking environment. 
the burnout, the lack of energy, the bad relationship that is caused by the friction of why aren't you ready for me? I need you now. I needed it yesterday. Get it, get on with it. We are paying a very heavy price because of the wrong assumption that in order to get more done, we need to cram more into our pipe. If we focus, if we manage multi-project properly, it's not only that we will be able to accomplish a lot more projects on time, is we will regain our sanity. And for me as a, as a psychologist, this is, this is something very valuable. This is why I wanted to mention it. So, so well said. I think there's on the LinkedIn Live, there's a question on the chat. Uh, uh, there's someone who's asking, what do you mean by a full kit? If you can just spend two minutes to answer that. Full kit is the checklist of all the items that we have to have available, that we have to have ready in order to get going with the project and not get stuck in the middle, that we can actually accomplish our part in the project without any further delays. So, so you, you need to know exactly what all you need and then you do a check in terms of you know, whether or not we had that. So it's always a good idea to have a checklist. Uh, uh, question, follow up question is, there, is, there is uncertainty. Some things are going to pop, but I can tell you for a fact, and we have a lot of evidence about it, most of the things that we get stuck before are not due to uncertainty. They are due to lack of full heat. We forgot or we were too under pressure and we'll just said, okay, we'll get going, we'll gather whatever we need on the way and then we get stuck and, and we get chaos. Mm. Okay. Uh, uh, maybe, you know, one last question before we go, because we are already at 40 minutes uh, when we started, uh, is, you know, where can people find more information about you and the work that you are doing? The book LinkedIn. they can buy on Amazon. But... LinkedIn. Efrat.goldrat at LinkedIn. Please join me. Uh, I am linked to very, very many specialists around the world who are implementing the rules of flow in every area you can possibly think of, whether it's medicine, to army, to air force, to banking, to software, um, construction, anything you can possibly, the rules of flow, what, what, what is amazing about them is that they are universal, not only worldwide, but, only, but also across every area. So join me on LinkedIn. I will do my very best to link you to other people. Um, Gold of Consulting is operating virtually worldwide. Uh, and there are a lot more co uh, consultants these days that are doing flow. So get on board. Super. So I had one more question that uh, I got uh, as a private uh, uh, chat uh, from one of the uh, live uh, uh, participants. So uh, they're asking, uh, there are times when you are working on internal projects where you can actually uh, uh, try and implement what you're talking about. What happens when we are, uh, for example, delivering a project for a customer, let's say software implementation for a particular customer. If, uh, if we cannot just go and tell a customer that we will not start working on your project now, uh, because there is a whole lot of other projects in the pipeline. So how do we deal with that situation? Any well, thoughts? Beginning is difficult because the customer believes that only if you get started with it early that you have a chance to complete. So in the beginning, we need to make some assurances. We need to make some promises. Sometimes a, a penalty will be involved if I'm not late. But you will see that after the first project, when you actually are, uh, it's just a transition phase that you have to negotiate with the client. Trust me, I know what I'm doing. I will get it on time. And there are various ways to go about the transitional period. But after that transitional period, if you are properly managing uh, the projects, customers will trust you because they haven't seen it before, that you are going to deliver, in fact, on time, on budget, and without compromising on the scope. So you will gain customers for life. It's just about that transition and here in the transition, it depends on the relationship with the customers. There are different ways to go about it. Super. And um, um, uh, a follow-up question from Ian: Does this work for all sorts of project environments? So, for example, 
Um, there are a lot of innovation projects that uh, uh, my clients uh, uh, run, which is not very, how do I put it, uh, uh, which is not very end driven. So there is no clear end date uh, for the project to be finished at. So what about those kind of projects? Excellent question. Here is the situation. We are fully aware that the solution of the rules of flow are to speed up a flow in the operation. But sometimes the constraint or the way to move forward is not in the operation, but in other areas, such as what should be the innovation? What should be our next generation of products, our next generation of um, a service? And in that, we do have, in theory of constraints, another implementation for innovation that is not less eye-opening. And I welcome you uh, to a contact, my brother, who is the head of Goldot Consulting worldwide. His expertise is in innovation, and he will be able to give you a much better answer than I am. In fact, uh, uh, I had the opportunity to have a, a interaction with him. He, in fact, presented at one of our user group conferences and shared his insights on um, how uh, DOC as a concept can be implemented in the, um, uh, in innovation uh, environment as well. So uh, maybe I, I link uh, the recording of that uh, video as well as part of this uh, uh, conversation on a comment. That would be amazing. I have to go really soon. Okay. My last comment. Yes. Uh, because the so thank you so much. Oh, you're more than welcome. It's finally available in India. And it is available on, on since of the, oh yeah, September 1st, it is available on Amazon.com and also our amazing, amazing uh, printer and distributor, Muki and Sons. If you go on their uh, uh, website, you can get a discount for bulk sales because sometimes, you know, when an organization wants to get on board, they need a lot of managers to be in the picture. Um, actually, I will be in India next week. This is why I'm sorry, but I have to cut it short. <laughs> um, for the formal launch. Three cities, right? We have in three cities. Uh, three cities every day. I'm flying overnight. And then the next day I have the next launch. Bangalore, Chennai, and uh, Pune. And we are expecting to meet a few hundreds of managers. And this is exciting. I'm excited to go. I haven't been in, in uh, India since before COVID. So that will be amazing. <laughs> so thank you so much, Afrat, uh, for uh, taking time and uh, talking to me uh, and uh, sharing your insights with uh, my community. Um, I really, really appreciate uh, uh, both uh, your time as well as uh, your insight and um, highly recommend people to, uh, uh, if you are familiar with TOC, uh, I'm pretty sure you will enjoy the book a lot more. Even if you're not familiar with TOC, I'm pretty sure there is a whole lot of insights that you will get from the book. Um, thank you so much for your time. And thank you for having thank you so me. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.